Okay, I'm gonna go pretty fast because I have two mini talks and then room for questions afterwards. Um, so first I'm gonna talk about internet archiving, uh, specifically in the context of mesh networking um, and, and distributed content storage. So if you haven't thought about internet archiving before, um, it's basically a way for people to save websites that they care about, either in a centralized fashion using something like archive.org or another central provider, or in a decentralized way uh, like Andrew Lewis was talking about earlier today where we all keep our own little archives of thing things that we think are important on our own computers. Um, I'm gonna talk more about the decentralized aspect today. Um, so why is preserving information important? Like Andrew was talking about earlier today, if we don't have a copy of anything, we approach Library of Alexandria mass scale loss of information in 20 or 30 years, like we're already seeing with old sites in the 90s going down and losing lots of great content. Um, so aside from archive.org, there are actually lots of other really, really good projects. Um, and I've made a little index of them here called the Web Archiving Community. So I have lists of lots of open source projects, organizations, groups, uh, major institutions and universities, uh, public services that are free and centralized, uh, pieces of software, uh, I'll post the link at the end also, and then blog articles and people to follow if you're interested in this community. Um, there's a lot in there, so I won't go over all of it. So what are some of the benefits of decentralized other than the fact that if a central service goes down, you know, we lose everything? It's also that central services have limited storage capacity. So actually, they don't wanna archive everyone's browsing history. Uh, that's not something they're gonna be able to do. But individually, we can archive a lot more content than a centralized server will ever be able to have. And if we use a service like IPFS, uh, we can share that content and discover it between people. Um, so why is this hard? Why, why aren't we all doing this already? Um, content is dynamic and inter interactive. Uh, not everyone talks about this, but Pages have JavaScript, they have interactivity. And it's not just a matter of saving the JavaScript and allowing you to execute it again, there's also like server resources that will change that are, are stateful and depend on the time of day or the weather outside. Um, and also services that depend on other peers interacting with you. So all this stuff is hard to archive and there are a few different approaches. You can just save a snapshot of what you see with a headless browser like Chromium, which is a, a tool that I wrote called Archivebox does that. Um, or you can literally record the screen. You can take a screenshot. And it, that's surprisingly versatile, actually. A screenshot is often way better than a lot of other things because it's durable. It'll last for a long time. And then you can always OCR it later or save a PDF if you, if you want that. PDF is, is 40, 30 years old at this point, so it, that's durable. Um, another reason why it's hard is not all content is accessible to everyone. So having a distributed archive where some people have cookies to get beyond a paywall, uh, some people have uh, content in different languages, basically a multi-pronged approach is always gonna be able to cover more content than any centralized service. Um, if you're doing this in a decentralized fashion, you're trying to share stuff with IPFS, there are lots of nitty gritty details like how do you do content discovery, how do you, how do you hash content that's dynamic. Uh, Base32 is actually hard in its own, like there are different variants of Base32 that have different nuances of how they work in URLs. Some file systems are case insensitive, some file systems don't support UTF-8. Lots of details when you have to cover all of the edge cases for archiving. So I'm gonna skip some of the details because I only gave myself a minute for each of these sections. Um, so what can you do today if you wanna start archiving stuff? Um, I highly recommend going to that link. Uh, I'll po post it at the end. Check out some of the open source projects for personal archiving. Um, Web Recorder is amazing. It's started by some of the ex-employees from the Internet Archive. Uh, Ilya Kramer is one of the big developers of it. Web Recorder essentially runs a version of a headless browser that replays what you do as you scroll through a site and interact with it. Um, there's also Archivebox. Uh, you can actually run the Internet Archiving software, uh, Heratrix, uh, one of them offline. Um, but I highly encourage you to go out and start thinking about how you can archive your own stuff. Even if that's in a browser, clicking, you know, Command S, save the page as HTML. Or use a service like Pocket uh, or Pinboard that saves it and allows you to export your data. Exporting is important, you should own your data. Oh, uh, but don't try and rehost it unless you own the rights. Uh, you'll get in trouble. Or if you do, put robots.txt no index. <laughs> That's my advice. I learned that the hard way. Okay, second talk. Totally different. I'm going to talk about Laura. <laughs> so Laura is a really, really cool piece of tech. This is the sticker, so look for this logo. Um, I think it stands for Low Power Data Bandwidth Everything Radio. Uh, Laura 
is super cool because you can have a tiny little thing this big with a 3,000 milliamp hour battery and it'll last a year. And it'll keep chirping out and the reason why it goes so far is because Lora doesn't just use a single channel, it actually sleeps for like 30 seconds and then it'll send out a chirp across like 10 channels. And so anything listening, it's very resilient to like noise, uh, or like degradation of signal over long distances. So you can do cool things like have a tiny device that with a year long battery, uh, you can do internet of things, sensors all over a city that all talk to each other. Um, and the way LoRa networks typically work is that you have a gateway, one central hub that has good power and can amplify low powered signals from elsewhere and listens continuously instead of every 30 seconds. And then you have these nodes spread out around a city or around a building um, that send chirps of little bits of data to the central gateway. Um, so I thought about doing this in Montreal and initially I wanted to build a little node with a solar panel and a battery and lift it with a drone and drop it on top of the cross uh, at, on the Montreal mountain. Um, that's dubiously legal so I, I'm, I'm not going to do that publicly. Uh, <laughs> But if you're interested, come talk to me. We, we can work out <laughs> le legal ways to do this by asking for permission from building owners. And I don't know, there are lots of ways to do this. Uh, so of course you can do all the typical IoT things like weather sensors, disaster radio. Uh, but I wanna talk about my particular goal. Um, and this is something my high school teacher, I had a really great high school science teacher, and he had a computer running in the back of the classroom at all times uh, with a map of every lightning strike happening in the country in real time. And he never really explained it, but kids would walk over and they'd be like, wait, what is this? And he'd say, oh, it's a map of every lightning strike. And we'd be like, wait, how? And he'd say, think about it. And so over the last five years, I've been thinking about it. And he, <laughs> <laughs> of course he did actually explain it to us eventually, but uh, what I wanna do is recreate that network. And there's a global network already doing this, but I wanna do this with Laura. And the way to do this is to set up uh, nodes around the city enough that you can triangulate a signal um, and put an SDR and GPS on each one of them. GPS is not only for location, it's actually for accurate time. So GPS gives you nanos nanosecond resolution time and the SDR lets you measure uh, just radio waves in general. So um, what I wanna do is have like 10 nodes in the city, each with an SDR and a GPS and wait for these massive, you know, when lightning hit, hits, it's like, white noise across the entire spectrum. You time exactly when it reaches each of the nodes and then you can triangulate the lightning strike. You can go and you can collect the glass that is formed wherever it hits or see the burning tree or whatever's there. That's my personal goal. Beyond that, I don't know if it's really usable for anything. If you have ideas, let me know. <laughs> oh, and each node can cost less than 50 bucks. So it's, it's a viable thing. And then eventually, I don't know, in like 20 years, we'll connect a, a line of nodes from Montreal down to New York. Um, so if you wanna get started with Laura, um, the really good board is the PyCom PyPy or the PyCom LoRa board. Uh, those are great because you can run MicroPython on them. Uh, SparkFun also has some good ones. Uh, and the, a good gateway network is the Things Network and they just have lots of resources in general. Uh, you can buy the raw chips, the LoRa chips themselves for like cents. Um, those are microcontroller boards. Okay, so if we have time for questions, some miscellaneous projects, come talk to me if you're interested in these. Uh, I wrote a mesh networking library that's like Lego blocks for testing mesh network topologies. Uh, you can use something like Scapy to actually build the traffic, but then this will let you build virtual and physical links on a computer to test how traffic propagates across the network. Uh, then I wrote a botnet that runs on top of that. Uh, it's not dangerous, I swear. Uh, SIP and Gatekeeper on Mac will keep you safe. I wrote some docs for WireGuard. WireGuard is an amazing VPN. You can use it to build mesh networks. Uh, you just have to provide the link layer and then you can use WireGuard for routing. Um, and then we've also been thinking about distributed DNS lately uh, using a proof of history blockchain called Solana, where you replace the root servers in DNS uh, with this central authority and you get a lot of cool properties. So talk to me if you're interested in those. Uh, uh, the GIST link for the slides is here. You have about five seconds to take a picture if you want that. <laughs> and then I think I'm out of time basically. Oh yeah, questions. <laughs> we have time for a couple questions or a request to have a slide back. <laughs> I see a question over here. Oh, it was a thought. <laughs> oh, I see one. 
Thank you. Just came in for the Laura part. Um, very interesting. Uh, just sort of caution when using Laura, make sure that the, the spectrum point that you're using is, is available, is unlicensed. Oh yeah, there are three and you have to find the one for your country. There's like 900 and 400, or they're like two 400 ones or something. Yeah, talk to an, to an expert or Google it. I'm not an expert. <laughs> Another question? Okay, let's say thank cool. you again to Nick. Thanks.